Um, I think anything that starts to give you a greater awareness of the power of the mind, or sometimes people call it the power of intention, um, having that purpose out in front, that, that, that the group will witness to or reflect the state of mind that you bring to it. In other words, you know, whatever you show up, you know, and the attitude you show up with, you know, will be reflected. And it so flips things around from being a part or a member of a group, an individual member, to really working with, with mind. I remember I was in university for 10 years and I just to just start experimenting with my mind, you know, some people talk about, you know, cloud busting with your mind or things like that that people would have always done. I remember uh, in the later years, I remember going to this evening class, it was like a three hour, uh, maybe three, three and a half hour writing class and uh, the <coughs> professor's name was Clyde, I remember Clyde Dorn. And I'd go into Clyde Dorn's, you know, literature writing class, and I was just uh, getting into euphoric states of mind and heart-to-heart -heart discussions and being very transparent. This was a literature class, like a writing and literature class, and I was getting into these heightened states of mind and. And I would start to think, like, you know, this whole world is just a reflection of my mind. So I'm going to have fun with this and play with this and everything. And so we would go into the class, and he was very personable and friendly, and he would start talking and saying, you know, we spend quite a few hours with us every week. He said, how are you doing and everything? And we started talking. I would get into talking about near-death experiences and all, all kinds of things, anything that was fascinating my mind at the time, astral projection and all kinds of things. And of course everybody that showed up in the class was absolutely captivated and fascinated and we would get in there, it would be like this, whatever, three and a half hour class, and we would get off the topic, whatever, you know, we we're supposed to be learning and and he would completely lose control. Uh, of the class every single week uh, and he would, after some like two or two and a half hours, he would just be going, what is happening in my class? This is unbelievable. But it was, I was having so much fun with my mind and the playfulness of it and, and I was being so open and transparent that everybody was drawn into it with me. Uh, you know, it was like, let's talk about what's meaningful. Uh, maybe I thought I was coming here to learn how to write something or something, but that really pales in comparison to what this is. People were hurting, they, they wanted, it was almost like free spiritual psychotherapy, you know, every Monday night or whatever, whenever the class was. And I would, I would just pray and get my mind into that vibe before I would go in and, and just love it. I would just watch the whole class get away from him like a, like a kite in the wind and he had no clue how to get it back. He would try to, to reel it in and everything and I was having fun with my mind, playing with my mind and, and then he would just inevitably just get crack a big smile like he loved it just as much as everyone else did except he was supposed to be in the role of the teacher, you know, assigning the grades, making sure that, you know, you really earned your credits and all this and that, but he would inevitably cave uh, at some point to just sitting there, you know, what just like, I love this, like, I'm so glad I'm here. And, you know, and that would be fun. But, but that was, these were early experiments in the power of the mind, you know, and and so I would just continue to practice and practice and practice and practice. So it takes us away from process and methodologies and what can you interject and so on and so forth to, to a much broader scope and, and scale. And, and, and freeing your mind. It's like in the Matrix, you know, when Morpheus jumps across the buildings. That's a powerful experience for Neo. You know, he goes, whoa, you know, he's just, 
taken aback by, by such a thing. Like, he would never imagine that a Morpheus is going to launch off of one building and jump across to the other. It just wasn't in his, his awareness. But it was a training program designed to have him expand. You know, how, if they had the sparring program going, you know, and they're, they're kind of battling it out, and then at the end, it's like, how did I beat you? And, and he's like, you know, you know, you're so fast, and, and all these other things, and, and Morpheus says, do you believe that's air that you're breathing? See the depth of the question? It had nothing to do with the techniques at all. Do you believe, it was a question. Do you believe, he had forgotten that it was a sparring program, it was just digital imagery, and it had nothing to do with, with breathing at all, with characters that breathe. This was just imagery. And the more that you get into quantum, and the more that you get into the mind training with the Course, and all these things, you, you start to realize that it's all digital. It's just pixels. You know, just like if you went to a movie and you watched a movie on a screen, you'd say, hmm, it's just a bunch of pixels, really. And to think about mom and dad as pixels, it's like, whoa! <laughs> that's, that's a mind stretch. But it's a good, it's a good kind of mind stretch for us. Um, I remember, you know, one time when I had the students back in the 1990s, um, the, they wanted to go with me to a movie, and they brought their kids, and so one of them brought little Matthew along. He maybe was maybe six or seven years old, and he was like a little mystic. He would like, he had such a great sense of mind training at like six years old, that that when, you know, the ice would melt on the lake where they lived, uh, he would just when it was melting and everything, he would go out and go swimming in this icy, icy water. And adults would see him out there at this particular time in whatever, March or whatever in Michigan, and they would almost just stop and look in disbelief, it's like, there's a, there's a boy out there. There's a boy out there in the water. And some of them would go up and actually have to touch the water because they couldn't conceive of somebody swimming in that. So he was a little mystic. Uh, that. And we were, we were going out one time and we were going to see this movie, some of you might have seen it, called Little Buddha with Keanu Reeves. And so we go into the theater and he's like, he pulls away from his mother's hand and he comes running over and she's like, no, 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 I, wanna, I have to sit next to David, I have to sit next to David. And he's got a very strong voice, so she does not want him, he's a questioner too, questions everything. She does not want him to be one of those loud, six-year-old boys, disturbing everything, you know, people furiously. So she's like, no, 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 you can't, you can't do that. And then he's like, no, no, I have to sit next to David. So finally, she says, if you're okay, you go, but you and David can sit in the because she didn't want the voices, you know, if you're going to make a noise, make it right at the screen in the front where people can hear you. Because nobody, there wasn't many people in the theaters to go. So we go up there and we're sitting there and I'm sitting there and we're watching Little Buddha and he's watching Little Buddha and his eyes are real big, he's six years old and he sees the movie playing out and then it comes to the part where Siddhartha, you know, is going to face all the temptations of the world. You know, the flaming arrows are like coming at him from marches, legions of armies marching against him as he's sitting in there, you know, in this lotus position. Here they come, and then they're launching these flaming arrows. And by the time they reach Siddhartha's still <coughs> mind, it's just like, like little flower petals. You know, the flaming arrows, the attack thoughts are not attack thoughts at all in his perception, because the power of the mind is so strong, it's just like, little flower petals coming down. It's really beautiful. And then it's got some scenes, you know, where he spills open, spills over a little a pitcher or a, a container of water and it spills and then this image that comes out from, he reaches down and pulls it out of the water. It's like an image of, of the body self 
and it starts to get angry and rage at him. He goes through all these temp very graphic temptations of, to believe in Maya, you know, to believe in the illusions of the world. It's a spectacular, well shot, great cinematography. Little Matthew's there watching and so he goes through all these temptations, Siddhartha does, and he's just totally, you know, Kiana's just sitting there in total stillness. And he points his finger up and he says, um, I want that mind. Wow. The little six-year-old says, and I look over and I said, yes, yes, yes. And then, then he goes, I will have that mind. And I said, yes, yes, yes. And then three seconds later, he's just, Kiana's just as still as could be. He's like, I am that mind. <laughs> These are the kind of encounters. This is just a witness to the mind, you know, to the state of mind. You're drawing forth witnesses in the world that are just playing out and acting out that sense of coming to a sense of certainty of who you are. And it was just fun with him because we had, it was, it didn't have anything to do with the age of the body. It's all just reflections of, of mind. I didn't, I didn't really try to, I didn't really do any kind of, any kind of techniques with him or work with him in any kind of unusual way. Although people, most people who would observe would, might have thought I was being quite unusual, like, uh, like when I'm working with all the students and the adults and they, they're meditating and they're becoming more and more metaphysical and more and more question and answer sessions like this and becoming quite, the parents were getting quite disinterested in the children and from the children perspective they were getting quite bored. It's like, they used to be fun, now they just, they just read the stupid blue book the whole time and they sit around and meditate, they're really good for nothing. You know, they're not fun, they don't play, you know, it's, they're just, talk about metaphysical ghosting, they're like, they are ghosts, they are ghosts of parents, they're not fun anymore. And so, I would, I would get together and meet with the, the young children and they would all have a lot of complaints about how dead the parents were becoming in the spiritual journey. And so, I would say, well, I said it's just because they see you as separate from their spiritual path. You were their former life and now they've got a new metaphysical life and they're always asking questions and so forth. And they're like, what can we do about this? This is terrible. I said, well, I'll work with you and you'll be like little Buddhas. Uh, I'll work with you to advance your mind training so fast that that will get their attention. Because they're into spiritual advancement and if you are spiritually advanced in unmistakable ways, that will get their attention. They will not be bored. They will be asking you to hang out with them. So, we practice. I would go off with the kids and we would, some people would say unconventional things. I would use things like, um, I would say now, we're going to do a session with your parents and you know, where they're going to, well, I'm going to say to the parents, try to make the kids laugh. And the parents are going to laugh and go, well that's not going to be hard. And they'll try to tell jokes or they'll try to make funny faces or do all kinds of things that they typically do to make you laugh. But, but I said, you aren't going to laugh because it's, it's all a perception, you know, nobody makes you laugh. You only laugh when you want to laugh and you don't laugh when you don't want to laugh. They're all like, really? And so, yeah. So I work with them on that whole thing. That was like first level training. Uh, to be able to keep a straight face when parents are making funny faces and doing all these bizarre things. Just let go of those past associations. They're not funny at all. You don't have to laugh at all. It's just a choice. And so I worked with them on that for a couple of weeks. Then I said, now we're going into the second level training. This is going to really shock them. This will get their attention. If the first one doesn't. In fact, the parents will probably try to get physical with you if they do stuff and you don't laugh. They're going to come at you. And they're going to try to tickle you to the left. They're going to come at your armpits. They're going to come at your knees and behind your knees. And they're going to come at these different points. But no one can tickle you unless you want to be tickled. You have to perceive the tickling in your mind. You're like, cool. Oh man. Gotta get.
get into that stuff. He said, we're going to practice with each other. We're going to really get good. You're going to be like little Buddhas, like a rock. So we practiced for a couple of weeks on that. The kids would practice mind training with tickling, where they'd say to each other, okay, come on, try to make me laugh. And sometimes they'd give in, and then they'd go, okay, got to work harder, and this and that. So, eventually, after a number of weeks, I brought the kids, we had the parents there, the parents were like, what's all this about? You're taking time away from our meditations and our questions. This better be good. And the kids are like, oh yeah. <laughs> so, then they, you know, we started off with trying to make me laugh. And so, and the parents tried all their things. And the kids were, didn't break a faith, you know, just were stoic, you know, in there with their mind training. And then, it was a little bit like the Matrix scene, where the parents were like, uh-huh, <laughs> I'm gonna get you. And they were like, <laughs> yeah, like bring it on. <laughs> like, show us what you got. And they came at those kids and under the arm and tried everything. The kids were just like, you know, just like, no, 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 not, notice I'm not laughing. You know, just, you know, just really, and it was quite striking to the parents, because it was again, it was just working with the training, and you know, anybody can do this mind training. It was, and the fact that children were super motivated because they felt excluded, they felt left behind, they felt that they weren't being paid attention to, and they wanted a sense of love and connection, and they weren't perceiving that, and, and so they had a motivation like we have a motivation at some point, you know, with enough pain and suffering and psychological difficulties, you do. Your motivation for peace grows and, and increases. And so that's just, again, those are just examples of, of having incentive for the mind training and then going to the groups, going to meet with people and friends more and more with the state of mind with just purely the desire to give it away, and with a wide open mind in terms of, of not having expectations of how far that can go. And, and it can go amazing, you know, can go into amazing heights, you know, when we, when we don't try to think small, or think for, and too small for what we can do.